Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Stanley from Singapore General Hospital. Today, we will learn about septic arthritis and reactive arthritis. We will learn to understand and recognize septic arthritis and reactive arthritis. We will learn about how to diagnose each of these two disease entities. After that, we will talk about the treatment strategies in these two conditions. Septic arthritis is defined as inflammation in a joint resulting from an active infection in the synovial or periarticular tissues. It is usually rapid onset and there's swelling, pain, warmth, and redness of the affected joint. Most septic arthritis happens from hematogenous seeding of the vascular synovial membrane after a bacteremic episode. It can also arise from direct penetrating trauma. In majority of cases, the culprit organism is a bacterial agent. The incidence of septic arthritis varies around the world. In the United States of America, the incidence is less than 200 for every 100,000 people in the population. The incidence is lower in European countries and higher in our Asian population. Those at extremes of age are more likely to develop septic arthritis. 50% of children with joint infections are less than 2 years old. 50% of adult patients are more than 60 years old. Septic arthritis happens quickly over a few days. It commonly affects one joint, but can affect a few joints as well. The patient has a fever and usually appears systemically unwell. The affected joint is red, warm, and very painful. It is very important that an acute hot joint is aspirated and the fluid sent for analysis. Antibiotic choice is given based on the most likely pathogen until stains and cultures from the joint fluid are available. There are several differential diagnoses of an acute monoarthritis. The most important is that we have to exclude septic arthritis in all cases of acute monoarthritis. Other possibilities that should be considered in our diagnosis is that of crystal arthritis like gout, first presentation of an inflammatory arthritis like RA, reactive arthritis, and trauma-related joint problems. One useful way to classify septic arthritis is to classify it into non-gonococcal and gonococcal type. Non-gonococcal septic arthritis increases with age, but gonococcal-related septic arthritis usually happens in sexually active young adults. Gonococcal septic arthritis also happens four times more common in females. It usually involves a polyarthritis that is migratory in nature. Tenosynovitis and polyarthralgia is also more commonly seen in gonococcal-related septic arthritis. Pustular dermatitis can also be seen in gonococcal septic arthritis, but this is absent in non-gonococcal-related septic arthritis. The joint fluid culture is positive in 90% of non-gonococcal septic arthritis. However, it is positive in less than 50% of the cases of gonococcal septic arthritis. Certain patient groups are at high risk of developing septic arthritis. The patient profile and the clinical setting also tells us about the likely infectious agent. This is a table showing that correlation. Staphylococcus aureus is the most common organism causing septic arthritis. However, certain patient groups are more prone to get certain bacteria causing septic arthritis. For example, those with SLE are more prone to get Salmonella, Neisseria meningitidis, and Streptococcus pneumoniae causing septic arthritis. 
those with intravenous drug abuse are more likely to get Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphylococcus aureus causing septic arthritis. Elderly patients are also more prone to get gram-negative bacteria causing septic arthritis. Let's now talk about diagnostic tools in septic arthritis. A joint aspiration is important as part of the evaluation of septic arthritis. The joint fluid is sent for gram stain and culture, cell count, crystal examination under polarizing light, and in the chronic forms of infectious arthritis, the fluid should also be sent for microbacterial and fungal analysis. The synovial fluid from a septic joint usually gives a very high white cell count, more than 100,000 per microliter. X-rays of the affected joint can show us soft tissue swelling or erosions as the disease progresses. In the more chronic form of infectious arthritis, the joint space is preserved and you can see marginal erosions. Treatment should always be started early in the case of septic arthritis. Patients with septic arthritis should be considered for drainage of the affected joint and a referral to orthopedic surgeon is important. Antibiotic therapy is key in the treatment of septic arthritis. The initial choice is empiric and based on history, examination, clinical setting, and the patient profile. Antibiotic choice is then adjusted if necessary after culture results are available. This is a table that shows a general guide for the antibiotic therapy of septic arthritis. Cephalococcus aureus is the most common organism causing septic arthritis. Antibiotic choice for this organism includes cloxacillin or clindamycin if the patient is allergic to a penicillin. Those with MRSA causing septic arthritis should receive vancomycin. Gram-negative bacteria causing septic arthritis should be treated with a second or third generation cephalosporin. In those with suspected gonococcus or meningococcus septic arthritis, rosafine is given either intramuscularly or intravenously. In all cases of septic arthritis, one should always consider consulting the infectious disease consultants or microbiologists of the hospital for advice. Next, we will talk about reactive arthritis. Again, we will learn to recognize reactive arthritis, how to diagnose it, and we will also talk about the treatment strategies of a reactive arthritis. Reactive arthritis belongs to the family of spondyloarthritis. This is a group of rheumatic disorders that share common factors such as inflammatory lower back pain, synovitis, antisitis, and various extraarticular symptoms. Spondyloarthritis may or may not be associated with the presence of HLA B27 and they are usually rheumatoid factor negative. The annual incidence of reactive arthritis varies worldwide and it is not common. In epidemiological studies, it is reported as 1 to 30 per 100,000 per population. Common microbes associated with the development of reactive arthritis includes enteric bacteria like Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter, bacteria causing urethritis like Chlamydia trachomitis and Mycoplasma genitalium, bacteria causing upper respiratory tract infections such as Chlamydia pneumoniae. The onset of reactive arthritis usually happens one to two weeks from the start of infection. It is important to recognize 
that in a small group of 10 to 25% of cases, the triggering infection can be asymptomatic. This is usually seen with infections caused by chlamydia trachomitis. The risk induced by GI infection is same for both sexes, although in cases triggered by chlamydia trachomitis, males are more likely to develop reactive arthritis. Classically, reactive arthritis is of an asymmetrical pattern causing oligoarthritis affecting mainly the large joints of the lower extremities, bearing in mind that sometimes a polyarticular form affecting the small joints of the hands and feet can also happen. In about 30% of cases, patients can have an acute inflammatory lower back pain, dactylitis, antisitis, and sacroiliitis can also happen. The involvement of sacroiliitis is usually asymmetrical. This is important to differentiate this from entities like ankylosing spondylitis, which is usually symmetrical. Extraarticular features can also happen in reactive arthritis, and this include eye symptoms like conjunctivitis and uveitis, Mucocutaneous symptoms like oral ulcers, circinate balanitis, and keratoderma planaragicum, urogenital symptoms like urethritis, and cardiac involvement like carditis and heart conduction abnormalities. But this is very rare. This is a graph showing the natural history of reactive arthritis. In 75% of cases, reactive arthritis can have a waxing and waning cause. Attacks can last 6 weeks, but some of them can even last up to 6 months. In 25% of the cases, reactive arthritis runs a more persistent cause. There are several risk factors that is associated with the worst disease. This include hip involvement and post reactive arthritis. It is also important to recognize that there are some morbidities that happened in reactive arthritis. These include aortitis, cardiac conduction abnormalities, erosive arthritis usually involving the feet, vision damaging uveitis, and spondylitis. Getting a good clinical history and chronology of symptoms is important in the diagnosis of reactive arthritis. Demonstration of triggering infection is also useful. For example, getting stool cultures in enteric infections and chlamydial PCR in urine specimen. Routine blood tests such as full blood count, ESR, and CRP is useful to show us evidence of inflammation. X-rays of the affected joints can also be obtained. Joint aspiration is a useful modality in the diagnosis of reactive arthritis and in excluding other differential diagnoses such as septic arthritis and crystal arthritis. Checking HLA-B27 is not always necessary and does not help in management. We will now discuss the treatment strategies in reactive arthritis. Triggering infection should always be treated where possible. Examples include giving azithromycin 2 grams as single therapy in acute chlamydia trachomitis infection. Antimicrobial therapy can also be given for enteric infection. Treatment of arthritis is important. NSAIDs can be given to help relieve joint pain and swelling. Corticosteroids can also be considered. Local steroid injection can be given for the affected joint. However, please bear in mind that septic arthritis has to be excluded first. Systemic steroids like oropretinicolone can also be given if the patient is severely affected by the arthritis. Disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs 
can also be considered, usually in cases that are not responsive to NSAIDs. Sulfasalazine has been shown in studies to be able to induce clinical remission in reactive arthritis. Other therapies that can be considered include biologicals, such as anti-tumor necrosis factor. There are no trials on anti-tumor necrosis factor agents in reactive arthritis. Conclusions are drawn from trials in undifferentiated spondyloarthritis. Non-pharmacological treatment includes physiotherapy, and this is important as it can reduce pain and prevent disability. We have now reached the end of our lecture. I hope through this lecture, you can now recognize and understand septic arthritis and reactive arthritis, and also understand that these two are distinct entities. These two diagnoses should be considered in a patient presenting with acute monoarthritis. It is very important to diagnose septic arthritis early and institute treatment as soon as we can. Thank you. I hope this has been useful for your learning.